Well, welcome everybody to the um, ISACA March meeting. We are excited to see you all online. Um, I see lots of people still coming in. Um, I'm just going to spend a couple minutes um, doing a few chapter um, updates, and then I'll turn it over to Casey, who will introduce our speaker today. And um, this is actually Dr. Gleb's Zoom room, and he'll be um, managing the chat and um, advancing uh, poll questions and all of those things um, today as well. Um, so let's see, Casey, could you take me to the, maybe the beginning? Thanks. Oh, sorry. That was the beginning. <laughs> Go ahead. Um, so just a quick update as to where we are with um, chapter members. We actually uh, technically lost like 200 members in that last um, PowerPoint just because we had a, I sat the international did clean up. Um, oh, sorry, Casey. All right. Um, see, can't talk that fast. Okay, uh, welcome to uh, some of our new members. If you see your name on here and you're here today, we're especially happy to see you. Um, we hope to see you at some more events. Um, in January, we did a She Leads Tech Update, um, uh, Uplift event, sorry. And uh, there's uh, some, some pictures of that here. That was at Maggiano's on a snowy January morning. Um, and then in February, we also met with IIA and did a joint session. So for those of you that were there, it was great to see you. Um, let's see, coming up, if you want to know what's happening with uh, your Denver ISACA group, our website is the best place to go. We've just recently added um, a few events. Our chapter meeting in April, that's our big one. That's about eight hours of CPE. It includes lunch and happy hour. We'll be at the Welshire. That's our AGM. So. Um, you can register for that now. It's on our website and emails will be going out shortly um, once we get past this event. We do have um, a SISM boot camp. So if you're interested in getting SISM trained, uh, there's a three day of boot camp to get that under your belt. Um, that's available for registration. We have an Alteryx technical training series that will go on May 2nd. This will be downtown in the Ruben Brown offices and you'll get hands-on exposure with Alteryx. So if you have an interest in data analytics tool, Alteryx, um, this will be great for you. And then, as you probably know, our Rocky Mountain Information Security Conference is scheduled June 11th to 13th. That's our big joint conference with ISSA, and registration is actually open now, and you'll start seeing a lot of advertisements for that um, coming up in the next few days. Um, CISA certification training, if you're interested in that, that is free to members. That starts on March 30th. Those are Saturday Zoom sessions with our trainer, uh, Mike Pedrick. Um, we think that the Domain 5 one might need to be rescheduled because of a CISM bootcamp that's concurrent with that. Um, and Mike can only be in one place at one time. So um, there might be a little adjustment to this April 27th and May 4th dates, but more information coming on that reach out to Mike Pedrick directly or go to our certifications tab on the website if you're interested in joining these CISA certification trainings. Our academic outreach group has been very busy over the past couple of months. They've made in-person visits connecting with students at Regis, CU Denver, MSU Denver. Um, there's a case competition that's currently underway um, for students and ISACA volunteers are the judges. I think they might still be looking for a couple judges. If you're interested, reach out to your board members um, and we'll get you lined up. There's 19 teams this year. And I think the top three get to come to the AGM and uh, be presented their awards. So you'll get to meet some of these great students at that um, event. And the academic outreach team, as I said, has been busy. They are, um, they were a very big supporter of our RMCCDC, that's the Rocky Mountain Collegiate Cyber Defense Com Competition. And many of you as our ISACA members attended and volunteered your time to help judge that competition as well. And Regis has been very appreciative of that, um, of the time that our academic outreach team that you can see here, Sangam and Munir, um, hanging out with the ISACA table and helping to run some of the events at that event. Um, and thank you if you were one of the judges. We really appreciate your time. Board elections. So um, our 
board, this is kind of our official announcement of the slate of board members that we're proposing for the next year. This is who you will see on your voting ticket. Um, but we'll have one more week for nominations. We are looking for a secretary. That's a pretty easy way to join the board if you want to get involved. It really is taking notes at meetings, helping set up our board meetings, things like that. So um, we would welcome a, a new face if you're interested in getting more involved. Um, but the rest of the members are um, names that you're familiar with. Um, Gail will be joining Casey as a VP of Education. Um, it's a pretty big job, so we're going to make that a two-man um, or two-woman job in this case. Um, but Gail has been doing our She Leads Tech um, Ambassador events this year, so uh, she's got great experience in that. Um, Suzette Nakoon, Blaze, staying on. Kyle has been our secretary for three years and moving into the treasurer role. Uh, we have a three-year max that you can stay in a board position. So that's why secretary is open. And our financials for the year as of the end of February are presented here. And if we, uh, we'll have a formal presentation of that at the AGM as well. So. Thanks so much. If you guys have any questions, um, you can reach out to me, Suzette Loving. Um, you can reach out to any of the board members by going to our website and getting in touch with us there. So with that, I'll hand it over to Casey. Thanks, everyone. Thank you, Suzette. As Suzette just mentioned, um, I am the VP of Education this year, and I'll be continuing on if you vote me in, that is. Uh, with the assistance of Gail. So those uh, ver surveys to vote will go out shortly, probably within the next week or so. But I have the uh, privilege of introducing Dr. Gleb today. He is our speaker. Dr. Gleb has been called the office whisperer and hybrid expert by the New York Times for helping leaders use hybrid work to improve retention and productivity while cutting costs. He is, also serves as the CEO of a boutique future of work consultancy, disaster avoidance experts, which helps organizations adopt a hybrid first culture instead of just incrementally improving on that traditional office centric culture. Dr. Gleb wrote the first book on returning to the office after the pandemic is a bestseller called Returning to the Office and Leading Hybrid and Remote Teams, a manual on benchmarking to best practices for competitive advantage. He's also authored six other books and is best known for his global bestseller, Never Go With Your Gut, How Pioneering Leaders Make the Best Decisions and Avoid Business Disasters. It's his first book to really focus on the cognitive biases in business leadership and reveal how leaders can overcome these dangerous judgment errors effectively. Dr. Gleb's experience comes over 20 years of consulting, coaching, speaking, and training for innovative startups, major nonprofits, and Fortune 500 companies. He also has experience as research and teaching background as a behavioral scientist studying behavioral economics and cognitive neuroscience of future proof strategic decision-making and planning, and cognitive bias risk management strategies in business and other contexts. Dr. Gleb earned his PhD in the history of behavioral science at the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill in 2001, I'm sorry, 2011, his MA at Harvard University in 2004, and his BA at New York University in 2002. He is a proud Ukraine American, Dr. Gleb lives in Columbus, Ohio. In his free time, he makes sure to spend an abundance of quality time with his wife so his personal life does not fall into disaster. We are excited to have him with us today to speak on the human factors of security, compliance, and risk management. I will now turn it over to Dr. Gleb. Thank you so much for that kind introduction, Casey, and welcome everyone. So let's talk about these human factors. And as Casey mentioned, I wrote a best-selling book on this topic called Never Go With Your Gut. So I'll be talking about going with your gut, making decisions that are good, that are bad. And that's what we'll be focusing on, the human factors, of security, compliance, and risk management. I've presented to over 30 psycho groups by now, so I'm pretty familiar with the audience, the folks like you in IT and auditing and cybersecurity. 
I'll be happy to talk about specific case studies and answer questions as we move along. So if you do have questions as we move along, please put them into the chat. That's the easiest way to get questions into to me and I'll aim to answer them as we go on. All right, everyone. So just so you know the shape of the presentation, we'll be first talking about the kind of errors that we tend to make because of our minds. So the human factors. What are the human factors? When we talk about human factors, we talk about the things that are related to emotions, related to intuitions, related to our decision-making. And there are certain ways that people make mistakes in security, compliance, and risk management. And that's what we'll be focusing on first, the specific ways that people make mistakes. So we'll go through those mistakes, we'll give some examples, and of these problematic patterns, we'll talk about ways that they might apply to you. We'll also be using polling. So watch, look for the polls that will pop up and you'll be able to vote. And so we'll be doing that as well. And we'll be doing some breakout groups as part of our discussions. Breakout groups to see how you would apply this information to your own work. We'll be taking regular break breaks. So don't to worry about going through this whole session without a break. We'll definitely be taking regular breaks around once every hour for around 15 minutes. So we'll have some time to check your email, do whatever you want, but do try to focus on the information on the presentation while I'm presenting without checking email, without getting distracted to the extent, of course, that you can. Okay. So again, we'll talk about some of the mistakes the way that we make mistakes, these cognitive biases, these dangerous judgment errors. And then we will, after we talk about these mistakes, we will then talk about how to solve them. So that'll be the second half of the presentation. So that's going to be the shape of the presentation. That's what you can anticipate. All right, everyone. let's move on and talk about how we make our decisions. Now, you've often heard that it's important to be confident when you make decisions, not only in your work in IT and auditing and cybersecurity, but in all sorts of areas. So let's talk about driving. When you're driving, when you're thinking about merging onto a highway, it's important to be confident and speed up when you're merging onto a highway, not slow down, even though it might be tempting to go slow. When you're changing lanes, it's important to speed up and not slow down. Again, it's tempting to go slow. So confidence is valuable. And so I want you to think about and tell me what your thoughts are about yourself as a driver. Do you think you are an above average driver or a below average driver? Please go ahead and vote in this poll. When evaluating your driving skills, are you in the top half or in the bottom half of all drivers? Please go ahead and vote. Okay, so most people participated. Let's give five more seconds for those who do, can't make up their mind whether they're in the top half or the bottom half. Okay, we see that 80% of us are in the top half and 20% of us are in the bottom half. So when we think about halves, we should have about 50% of us, of course, in the top half and about 50% of us in the bottom half. And what does that say about our decision-making and our ability to evaluate our decision-making when 80% of us think that we're in the top half and 20% of us think we're in the bottom half? Well, this has to do with one of these dangerous judgment errors that we make called the overconfidence bias. So in terms of the human factors of security, risk management, compliance, people tend to be way too overconfident about their abilities to make good decisions in these areas. You tend to be too overconfident, of course, as we saw right now in the domain of driving, and that translates to other domains, that's the overconfidence bias. We have a tendency to be way too confident as people. That's our psychology. And so that is one of the major human factors that you need to be aware of. 
when people say they're 100% confident, we have extensive studies showing that they're not actually going to be right 100% of the time. In fact, they're right in 80% of the time on average, according to these studies. It's especially dangerous for those with more experience and more expertise, with more authority. There was a study, for example, looking at doctors making decisions about cases that they were handed. And they looked, compared doctors who had more than 10 years of experience, so quite experienced doctors, to those who are just out of medical school, just recently out of medical school. And they found that when given the case and asked to make a diagnosis and recommend a course of treatment, they got the answer right about the same rate. The same rate. That might seem weird. Why wouldn't doctors who are more experienced and have more know-how gotten, gotten the answer right more often? Well, of course, their experience and know-how helped them get the answer right. But those who were just freshly out of medical school had fresher knowledge and they could recognize some of the symptoms and cases that the more experienced doctors couldn't. And so they got the answer right about the same percentage. However, more experienced doctors were much less likely to evaluate the situation more deeply, ask for more tests, and change their minds. So that's pretty dangerous. So I want you to just take a minute right now and think about where the overconfidence bias, and write down where the overconfidence bias might apply to what you observe in human factors of risk management, security, and compliance. Where might it apply? So please do take some notes on this because we'll be using this in our group discussions later. So actually do take some notes. All right, I'll give you a minute and wait while you take do that. Please go ahead. Munir and Brian, uh, this is not the poll. This is questions. Yeah, right. John is right. So you're taking notes. So this is not the poll. We'll have separate polling and we'll have separate opportunity for you to take notes for yourself. So again, 10 more seconds and then I'll go on. So Munir and Brian and others, make sure to take notes on how this applies to your work. And secure in the human factors of security, of risk management, security and compliance. Excellent, Brian. All right, let's go on. So that's the overconfidence bias. And now let's talk about more broadly the framework here. Business disasters and security compliance, risk management, and more broadly of all sorts come from bad decisions. The overconfidence bias is just one way we make bad decisions when we are overconfident about our abilities like our abilities as a driver. Let's talk about business decision-making right now because there's been a lot of research on that. There was a study of 423 companies with over 500 million in assets that went bankrupt from 1981 to 2007. 
And so this is before the 2008, 2009 fiscal crisis that swept away a number of good companies. This is So these are pretty sizable companies that went bankrupt. Now, when you look at the research on why they went bankrupt, 46% of the bankruptcy of these companies, 46% of their failures came purely due to poor decision-making, due to bad strategic decision-making by the leadership of the company. I'll give you an example. So you might remember Kodak, great photography company, very pioneering company, was very successful for a long time, and it created physical film, photography of all sorts, and actually an engineer there invented the first digital camera and patented it in 1983. And so digital cameras were becoming increasingly popular in the late 80s, early 90s, and the Kodak leadership was trying to decide well, do we invest into digital cameras or do we stick with physical film? Now, well, despite digital cameras becoming more and more popular, they were less profitable. They had a 30% profit margin, whereas physical film had a 62% profit margin. And so Kodak decided they'll let other people work on digital cameras and they'll work on physical film. At the same time, Fuji was making the decision. So Fuji, the leadership of Fuji, again, similar company in a similar business, was making the decision in the early 1990s. Do we invest into physical film or do we invest into digital cameras? And they were had the same profit margins. Now, the Kodak leadership decided that, no, we're going to let other people invest into, into digital cameras and we're going to focus on physical film because of the higher profit margin. But of course, the digital cameras kept getting more popular. Physical film kept getting less popular. And so even though they had good profit margins, their revenues kept going down and that's not sustainable. So in the late, or late 1990s, early 2000s, they tried to reinvest into digital cameras, but they were really too late because other players seized market share and eventually Kodak went out of business. Fujifilm, by contrast, decided to treat its physical camera business, physical film as a cash cow and squeeze it to, and invest the profits into digital cameras. And Fujifilm is quite successful right now. It's around it's a $6 billion company. So that's kind of the difference that we make, can see from companies making good decisions versus bad decisions. All right, that's an example. And here, that's an example of a company that went bankrupt due to poor leadership decision-making and the company in a similar position, similar business, Again, different leadership decision-making that was successful. Let's talk about why we make bad decisions. Denying reality is a common cause for bad decision-making. There was a study of 1,087 members of boards of directors who fired their CEOs. These are boards of directors that fired their CEOs. 23% of them were fired for denying reality. Denying reality. This is a major, major issue where leaders are just not looking at reality honestly and fairly and accurately and the boards of directors eventually get rid of these leaders and so you could see this happened with boeing after the 737 max disaster it's obviously in the news right now and with a number of bad decisions around quality and safety right so that's pretty terrible that after the 737 max disaster and after getting rid of the CEO who was there at the time and who was denying the negative consequences of the 737 MAX, the board got rid of him and they clearly did not put in a leadership that cleaned up its act. But that's an example of the leaders who are fired for denying reality, ignoring negative information about company performance. And so we need to realize that most bad decisions come from what we feel, come from our emotions we vastly underestimate the actual impact of decision of emotions in our decision making. Recent studies show that emotions drive 80 to 90% of our decisions when we let them, when we just go ahead and do what comes naturally to us. And so we need to use evidence-based strategies in order to make good decisions because otherwise emotions will drive us to make bad decisions. And that's why it's quite dangerous to go with your gut. Going with your gut is what gurus tell us to do, to go with your gut, trust your intuition, follow your heart, and 
that feels very comfortable. It feels good. But that's the human factors that cause us to make bad decisions around security, risk management, and compliance. It often leads to disasters in these areas because our gut is not evolved for the modern world. It's evolved for the ancient savanna. When we, and that's what dangerous judgment errors are like. They're called cognitive biases. They come from our evolutionary background and how our brains are wired. So think about our evolutionary background. In that ancestral savanna, we had to have a very strong fight or flight response to threats. It was life-saving for hunter-gatherers to fade because they were facing risks that were immediate, intense in the moment. Saber-toothed tigers, you might have heard of this as the saber-toothed tiger response. It was more important for us to jump at a hundred shadows than to miss one saber-toothed tiger. In the modern world, that's quite dangerous because the risks we face are long-term, uncertain. They might come from a notification of our smartphone about a new disease coming out in Wuhan, China, right? This is the kind of risks we face. And so many people greatly underestimated the impact of the pandemic. So many people are right now seriously underestimating the impact of generative AI and other tools. So this is something for us to really realize and think about. And I want you to reflect for yourself and think about the kind of decisions that you make. And so think about whether you make a bad decision when you realize you had the information you needed to make a better decision. So think about the situations in the past where you made a bad decision. Looking back, you realize, oh, I really should have made a better decision because I had all the information I needed, but you still made a bad decision. So please go ahead and answer whether that's something that ever happened to you. Please go ahead and vote. Okay, so most people participated. I'll give you five more seconds. Please go ahead and vote about making a bad decision. Would that ever happen to you? When you had the information you needed to make a good decision, of course. All right, so we see that this overwhelmingly happened to people. So I envy the 3% of you for whom this didn't happen. For the vast majority of us, I definitely know it happened to me. And for the vast majority of us, it happened. And so that's the feeling of falling into a dangerous judgment error, this cognitive bias. So cognitive biases is the specific term that scientists use for the dangerous judgment errors that come from how our mind is wired. So that is something for you to really be aware of. This is These are cognitive biases and overconfidence bias is one example of these cognitive biases. And so you want to learn about these cognitive biases and we'll talk about a number of them during this presentation. Learn about them and think about how they might apply to what you do, to your work, to the human factors of risk management, security and compliance so that you can help yourself avoid them and help those you work with avoid them as well. Now, at this point, I'm going to ask answer a question that a number of you might be curious about. Where exactly am I from? Of course, Casey mentioned that I have Ukrainian heritage, and that's part of my heritage. Another part of my heritage is Moldovan. So my dad is Ukrainian, my mom is Moldovan. Ukraine is unfortunately way too famous in the United States right now. Very sad. I still have some family in Kiev and some family in Lviv. My family came from Vinitsa, which is in southern Ukraine. Then I still have some family. There are no family left there right now, fortunately, but some in Kiev, which is pretty bad because it gets bombed heavily. Lviv is in western Ukraine, so it doesn't get bombed as heavily. My family is as okay as far as I know, but definitely a tough situation. So my mom's family is from Moldova, and that's where I was born in, in Moldova. It, Moldova is to the southwest of Ukraine. It's so small that you need an arrow to point to it on the map. It's a small landlocked country. So that's why I have that arrow over there, so you can see Moldova. 
And my parents, I was born in 1981 and I lived mostly in Moldova. Some spent some time in Ukraine, Crimea. And then I immigrated, my parents, I was a kid, 10 years old, immigrated in 1991 to the United States. So that's where I grew up. That's home for me, New York City specifically. That's where I grew up. And since 1991, I was especially glad that they left in 1996 when they saw a world values survey that showed that of all the countries in the world, Moldova, where I spent most of my time, was the least happy. The least happy country in the world. I don't know why, but it made me especially glad that I left. So I grew up in New York City. New York City is a cultural melting pot and it's very diverse. And so... You walk a block, you hear a dozen different accents. And that's why I chose to not get rid of my accent. And so I faced many questions where people asked me where I'm from. Not in New York City, because in New York City, it's usually not asked because there's so many people from everywhere and people have accents all the time. So unless you volunteer that information, it's often people don't ask that. But when you live outside of New York City, as I do right now, that's often asked. So I lived in UNC at uh, I got my PhD at UNC Chapel Hill. I still certainly got asked that a lot. Right now I live in Columbus, Ohio. It's more metropolitan, so I get asked that less, but I still get asked that sometimes. And so, what is going on there? What's up with the accent situation? Well, I learned at UNC Chapel Hill that not getting rid of my accent was kind of a dumb decision. When I was a kid, when I could have gotten rid of it, I was too old by that time when I was getting a PhD to get rid of it. And so the problem is a tendency called accent discrimination, which is a perception, a false perception, that those who have a foreign accent are less trustworthy. Those who have a foreign accent are perceived to be less trustworthy. So only one foreign accent to which this really doesn't apply, and that's the British accent. They still have that cultural imperialism going for them. British accents are perceived as being smarter, more elite, more sophisticated than American accents. But otherwise, the American mainstream accent is really the one that's best to use if you don't have, want to be perceived as less trustworthy. And so here we get a pair of cognitive biases called the halo effect and the horns effect. The halo effect and the horns effect. What's up with the horns effect? It's like someone having little horns in their head. If you tend to dislike one characteristic of someone, usually because it's a characteristic that you don't share, then you have too negative view of their other characteristics. Now, what's going on here? Well, we talked about the savannah environment with that fight or flight response when we lived in, when we had a hunter-gatherer lifestyle. Another aspect of that lifestyle was tribalism. So we lived in small tribes of 50 people to 150 people. And in that environment, it was very important for us to be strongly tribal. That meant being hostile to people from other tribes, because if they took over our tribe, well, then we'd die. And we also had to be friendly toward people from our own tribe, because if we were too unfriendly and not sufficiently tribally loyal, then they'd kick us out and we'd die as well. And you notice we're the descendants of those people who didn't die. So the halo effect is the opposite of the horns effect. It's kind of like having someone having a little halo in their head. If you like one characteristic of someone, you'll have too positive view of their other characteristics, which is especially dangerous for all sorts of business relationships. So thinking about in your IT auditing, there tends to be a hostility toward IT and auditing from some other departments, which don't like to, I mean, well, let's say auditing, of course, they don't like to be audited. They don't like to have their work evaluated. In IT, if you spend phishing emails to your own people, who've, right now I'm working with a company, consulting for a company on addressing the human factors of IT security, you know, and of security compliance and risk management. And we are starting a program of sending phishing emails to employees of the company to address the fact that they tend to have the danger of clicking too often on, of clicking on phishing emails. And so we need to address their intuitive dislike for being caught phishing, right? 
or being caught with spear phishing emails. It's a basic dynamic and it's a basic thing to do, but that causes dislike for people in IT, even though the point of this is to protect the employees. And you need to know how to address these challenges, these tendencies. You can't just say, well, they're stupid because they don't appreciate our efforts to protect them from spear phishing and that's not doesn't work. These are people and people have intuitions and you need to address their intuitions. So it's dangerous for business relationships within a company and of course from outside externally as well. It's dangerous for business relationships. And for hiring would be an example. So I'll give you an example here of how this works in hiring. And so this is going to be a presentation that I gave. That's the final keynote of a 2018. In 2018, I was giving a presentation to Hraco, which is the Human Resource of Association of Central Ohio. There's over 100 people in the room now who are passionate. And this is a diversity inclusion conference, their annual diversity inclusion conference. If you know anything about Columbus, Ohio, you probably know it as the home of the Ohio State Buckeyes football team. Very famous, and we have a big rivalry with the University of Michigan Wolverines. It's the biggest rivalry in college football, or at least one of the biggest. And so people in Central Ohio are passionate about the Buckeyes. And they're not so friendly toward the University of Michigan Wolverines. There's over 100 HR leaders in the room from large companies like Nationwide Insurance, as well as middle market and Patel and so on, as well as middle market companies. And so I'm going to ask them whether they will hire a University of Michigan fan. Let's see what they say about hiring a University of Michigan fan. So as you know, I'm a professor at Ohio State. I'm contractually obligated to root for the Buckeyes. <laughs> I'm guessing there are a lot of Buckeyes fans here, you know, go Bucks, right? Yo, there you go. Now, how likely are you to hire a Michigan fan? See, free people. Now, regardless of how we feel about Michigan fans and their poor, poor choices, <laughs> in which team to root for, does that indicate anything about their performance as an employee? No, I know. Come on, that no should be stronger. <laughs> All right, then. So hopefully that's illuminating. You see there are over 100 people in the room. Only three of them will be, and these are HR leaders in diversity who are passionate about diversity, equity, and inclusion. Otherwise, they won't come to a conference on this topic. And this is the final keynote. And only three of them would hire a University of Michigan fan. Three people. And they gave them a chance to change their mind. You saw that. They weren't willing to change their mind. So this is a very powerful tendency, the halo effect and the horns effect. If you have certain halo effects and horns effects, you will tend to make bad decisions around security, risk management, and compliance. If you have problematic reactions to IT, if you have too positive reactions toward others, that's quite dangerous. And so I want you to think about how this might apply to you, how this might apply to your own work. And so I'll launch a poll and have you think about how valuable would it be for you and your teams to address the halo effect and the horns effect. Please go ahead and vote. Five more seconds to make your voice heard on how valuable it would be.
Okay. So we see that it will be valuable for over 90% of you. That's excellent. And for just about two fifths, it will be highly valuable. For about half of you, it will be moderately valuable. Excellent. Glad to hear that. So let's take 30 seconds now that you know how to do this and write down where do you think addressing the halo effect and the horns effect might be valuable for you in your work in the addressing the human factors of security, risk management, and compliance. So take 30 seconds this time, since you already know how what you're supposed to do from last time. Go ahead. Okay, everyone. So let's go on and talk about another cognitive bias. So we talked about overconfidence bias. We talked about the halo effect and the horns effect. Let's talk about planning, fellas. So you probably heard the phrase that failing to plan, planning, failing to plan is planning to fail. Failing to plan is planning to fail. That phrase is a little bit misleading, to be honest, because it implies that when you make a plan, everything will go according to plan. But of course, that's not the case. So our intuition is to assume that the future will go according to plan. That is our intuition. We feel good about ourselves. We feel good about the future. And so we assume that the future will go according to plan. And that leads us to not prepare for problems and risks. So thinking about the human factors of security, risk management, compliance, there tends to be too much of a focus on Things going according to plan, not preparing for problems and risks, underestimating the resources needed of time, money, information, and social capital to make good decisions and to fix problems, to address issues. So the planning fallacy leads to many of our plans going awry and people not being sufficiently prepared to address problems in, again, risk management, security, compliance. This is pretty serious and can cause us a lot of problems. And I want you to think about and vote if how valuable do you think it will be for you and your team to address this problem, the planning fallacy, to prevent problems from growing awry because of insufficient time and resources and information and social capital allocation. Please go ahead and vote. Okay, let's give five more seconds to folks. Talk about planning, see if you have any more to share about addressing planning problems. Please go ahead. Okay, great. So this is even more popular than the halo effect and the horns effect. 
everyone finds this valuable, which is excellent. And over half of you find this highly valuable. Great. And just under half of you find it moderately valuable. So think about implementing this. Think about bringing this information back to your teams. Wonderful. All right. So at this stage, we'll get into breakout groups. What I'll want you to do in breakout groups is think about, well, let me actually take give you 30 seconds to talk about the planning to write down notes on the planning fallacy, and then we'll get it to breakout groups. So write down for 30 seconds where the planning fallacy might be causing a problem for you in risk management, security, compliance for your teams, and then we'll get into breakout groups. So please go ahead, take 30 seconds to think about that. All right, everyone, hopefully you took your notes. Good. So we'll get into breakout groups. What I want you to do is share with each other. So we'll have 10 minutes to do so for the breakout group. What I want you to do is start by having someone choosing whoever will be the note taker. One person to take notes for the group. So one person to be the note taker, and then you will have a discussion for 10 minutes where you share about each of these cognitive biases. So it'll take turns. One person shares about one cognitive bias, another person shares about another cognitive bias, go around and discuss your insights around each of these four cognitive biases that we discussed. The overconfidence bias, the halo, effect, the horns effect, and the planning fallacy. And talk about the impacts that they have as on the human factors of security, compliance and risk management, and what can be done about them. So that's gonna be the assignment. That's gonna be what you'll be doing. Are there any questions about what we'll be doing? Put your questions into the chat or unmute yourself. And if you have questions to ask about what we'll be doing. Okay, no questions. Then I'll open the rooms. Please go ahead into the rooms.
All right, everyone. Good. You're back. So let's start with sharing your thoughts. Whoever was the note taker for group one, can you can you share your thoughts for a minute? Yes, we just talked about the halo effect and having seen that uh, be predominant mm. in our experiences with uh, IT professionals and their managers. And we mm. also talked about how the um, trying to develop risks, a list of risks or bring those mm -hmm. up tends to not get a lot of participation. But when things go wrong, yeah. people freak out. <laughs> yeah, yeah, uh, definitely. That's kind of the planning fallacy where people, when you bring up, oh, people are reluctant to listen to a list of r risks and underestimating their likelihood of risks and the amount of time, resources, efforts needed to address them. And then, of course, they freak out when it actually happens. Thank you, Cynthia. Okay. No problem. Group two. Yeah, for group two, we, we focused mm -hmm. on the planning fallacy as well. Great. And talk through some some examples we've all mm -hmm. encountered, such as a project plan being too aggressive, you know, and mm -hmm. everybody thinking and saying they're on schedule until you reach that first milestone. You kind of got to prove that you did complete the milestone, and then you know that that obviously forces some recalibration. Mm -hmm. um, had an example around response plans and recovery plans as well mm -hmm. when teams do not actually practice and do tabletop exercises, wow. that's gonna have a massive effect on how effective th those plans are. Mm -hmm. um, and if you don't actually practice it, you know, it's not gonna yep. go as planned. Um, and then just the last one I'll say, mm -hmm. when, when not the, when, when you're planning and you don't put all the adequate time required to understand what expertise and resources you need for a particular project. And then you encounter, you know, there, there's areas that the existing team just doesn't have the skill set for or the expertise sure. for, and, you know, run into problems there that take the project, um, you know, off, off track. Yeah. Uh, it's definitely some good examples of the planning fellows and, the practicing and the tabletop, like you said, those are good ways of helping address it. Thank you. Appreciate that, Robert. You're welcome. Excellent. Group three. Hi. So our group kind of hit on uh, briefly all three of them. So we started mm -hmm. with planning and really talked about kind of some ways that we try to mitigate that, such as prioritization mm -hmm. and, and being flexible and and rotating things, um, but also how really uh, whenever we make a plan right, when it goes wrong, people just, they get upset pretty easily sure. by it, um, kind of shows that fallacy. Um, and then for kind of the horns thing, we were talking about um, job descriptions and hiring and mm. how we have it set to have certain degrees um, and a lot of job descriptions will say a certain degree or equivalent experience, but really like a lot of the AI technology kind of throwing you out if you don't actually mm. have the degree on there, right? And so there's kind of this bias that you know more just because you have the degree when someone else might yeah. have way more real life experience in mm -hmm. that area. Uh, similarity, um, you know, kind of that same same take with some training as far as mm -hmm. like people who maybe don't speak uh, English as a first language and thinking that they couldn't learn as well as someone who mm. is an English speaker. speaker. Yeah. And uh, then we kind of moved on to the confidence bias. So some examples of that is like, especially in the security area, they think mm. that they already know everything. So they don't want to mm -hmm. do training or um, they don't feel like they'll ever get caught by something because they're aware yep. of things and then it still happens to them. And sure. And also mm -hmm. healthcare also has some of those kind of um, role discrimination aspects, right? And government employees very set on what can apply to certain things. So that's what we discussed. 
Those are good examples and overconfidence bias. Uh, I'm glad you discussed those examples of the role and of the credentialing was certainly an issue. Thank you, Casey. Yep. All right, group four. We had a really good example of a halo mm -hmm. effect and the example yes. had to do with, with audits. And mm. it's, especially if you've audited an organization for quite a while and you've had interaction mm. with different departments and, and, and people and so forth. So you're making the decision, you know, whether to do it, you know, an interview or you're actually wanting to see a demonstration and, and test the controls. And if mm. it's someone that you've had positive experience with in the past, you may just do an interview and take their word mm. and not do the test and really check the control out thoroughly. That's a really good example, and it really reminds me of what happened with some of the problems with Enron and Arthur Anderson, where Arthur Anderson was doing way too much of taking the word of Enron employees for the truth when it actually was not the truth. And you really need to focus on being appropriately distanced in those sorts of situations when you're auditing. Thank you. Good examples. All right. Group uh, four. I think five. We're five. five. I think we went yes, through yes, four. Yes. I think. Yeah. Yes. Okay. No worries. Thank um, you. We all put ourselves in the top half of the good drivers for the overconfidence mm -hmm. fallacy. So we discussed that. Um, we also touched on the similar to group three um, that we as security pros may believe that we will be able to spot the threat and may not mm -hmm. security awareness training maybe is not appropriate for me, but are, is that an overconfidence bias? Um, planning fallacy, we discussed that when we do risk assessments, we think we know what could go wrong. What are the types mm -hmm. of risks that we should consider? Um, and there may be risks that are unforeseen, or there may mm -hmm. be some that are on the list of possible, but just we underestimate the likelihood. So for instance, yeah. we talked about the pandemic. We've all heard about it. We knew it was a risk beforehand, but um, obviously we were, we were caught off guard. Um, and then horns and halos, similar to group three, um, we talked about interviewing. Um, and how mm -hmm. our just biases can influence the person or information they provide. Um, and that we may be over-influenced and not necessarily mm -hmm. um, focusing on the, the criteria that's in line with the job, but maybe too focused on our existing bias. Excellent. Some good examples. And I'm glad that you talked about the overconfidence bias and that all of you put yourself in the top half and how that impacts <laughs> overconfidence. Yep, definitely. Good. Thank you, Christopher. All right. Group six. I'm not sure if we're group six, but I'm going to guess we are since there was all a little right. bit of silence. <laughs> okay. Um, we, we tried to cover all of them. We um, talked mm -hmm. about uh, annual budgeting and the overconfidence that comes with that. Oh, yeah. So mm -hmm. you you get to the, you know, the year end before the budget's going to launch and you got it all locked and mm -hmm. everyone thinks it's great. And then you get in the middle of the fiscal year and something happens and it all goes awry. Yeah. But they yeah. won't adjust the planning so no one can meet the deadlines and yet we're supposed to be agile with planning and and concern ourselves about security so um there's that and then one yep. of our um teammates brought up some of the memes that you see with the halo mm -hmm. effect like a girl innocently eating crackers and someone <laughs> will say she looks like she owns the place and oh, i yes, think we, yes, yes. as auditors we kind of get that way with certain audit subjects auditees mm -hmm. where we before we even launch an audit with them, we're talking amongst ourselves like, oh gosh, we have to audit this guy. <laughs> His stuff is going to be a mess. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And we tend to like uh, be biased in our findings with that group. Sure. That's and then um, as we're launching an audit, we can tend to be overconfident um, mm -hmm. because we know how it will go. We know the area. We've done it before. Then we get into the audit and we encounter something that we haven't encountered before. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. then things go quickly off the rails. So that's kind of kind of the stuff that we discussed. That's really excellent. And I'm glad that you focused on the auditing and the kind of problems with overconfidence and planning policy that are associated with. Thank you, Joe. All right. Group seven. I'm also not sure which um, group we were, so I'm going to assume we're seven. Um, 
But uh, our team was talking about the overconfidence bias, um, mm -hmm. how a lot of times like the loudest voice in the room is kind of the one that's most heard, or if they yeah. say it confidently enough, um, mm -hmm. you know, people go with their plan or they assume it's correct. Um, some of us in the room are auditors. So we were saying we've seen that a lot with clients where they think that their <laughs> environment is super secure, all the controls are in place, and they're just kind of saying it like with an overconfidence. Um, mm -hmm. But once you actually do the testing, that's not always the case. Yeah. That's definitely the case. The clients will be way too confident before an audit. Yep. And then you show them and they're like, oh, yeah, that's an issue. All right. Thank you. Appreciate it, Helen. Group eight. I don't know what group we were, but I'll go ahead and speak for our group as well. Um, pay attention right. this time. But um, we had a lot of the similar things that have already been brought up. Um, so mm -hmm. I'll. Uh, you know, on the halo effect, we talked about interviewing from an audit perspective. Mm -hmm. We also had some good examples of prejudging sort of audit mm -hmm. fees or audit areas based on either past experience that you've directly mm -hmm. had or just hearsay or impressions that you've um, taken over time. Um, and then as it related to the overconfidence and planning kind of as a combo of those, um, mm -hmm. someone in our group had a good example of um, being overconfident and estimating how long it takes you to do something. So when you put together yes. a budget for a project, you believe that you can, you know, from a man hours perspective, get it done a lot quicker than what it actually will take. Um, so that, you know, everyone could definitely relate to that as well. Yeah, absolutely. And the, the, these cognitive biases, talking about them separately, but they, of course, combine quite often. That's a good example of when they combine. Thank you. Appreciate that. All right. Group nine. If you're not sure which group you were, first of all, pay, do pay more attention next time. And second of all, you're probably group nine. <laughs> well, I thought we were group 11, but I'll go anyways. Okay, um, I'll go anyways. Uh, we, we talked about horn and halo and mm -hmm. um, the, the noticing that the importance of using objective assessments versus feelings and where the group mm -hmm. talked about this the most was in actually in the hiring process, regardless of which side of the table you're sitting on. Um, for the overconfidence, yeah. we said um, people had noted in their organization, um, you know, people believing that someone is not a bad actor or that they are not having a security breach um, mm -hmm. and, and being overconfident that that's not happening to them. Um, and someone noted um, uh, management having over trust of employees where they yes. were being granted too much access to systems or one mm -hmm. person is granted too much responsibility for a single activity. Mm -hmm. So there were inadequate controls and, and um, not paying attention to having a proper segregation of duty. And then in the planning fallacy, we had folks, too, who noted that the planning fallacy has, seems to have an overconfidence element to it as well. Sure. And they had noted in their organization where they've seen management start a plan and it, it goes bad, but they don't seem mm -hmm. to stop the plan. And they mm -hmm. don't seem to be their own devil's advocate and reevaluate the plan and, and be skeptical about whether it really makes continued sense. Um, yeah. People noted organizations responding to just the latest fire and therefore <laughs> not a lot, again, not a lot of planning going on. So <laughs> those were the primary things we talked about. Excellent. Thank you very much. And with uh, the managers often, if they are not trained, they will, their emotions will lead them to, unfortunately, <laughs> stick with bad plans uh, and not reassess plans that they came up with. So that's that's a problem. That's one of the benefits of going to this kind of training. All right. One of the two remaining groups, please share your thoughts, either 10 or 12. I'll, I'll go. This is a, uh, this is group 12. Um, All right. We, we, we talked about, we talked about on the planning fallacy. We talked about, um, <laughs> The, the perspective of spending money on tools gives the perception that you are somehow more safer from a security threat mm -hmm. um, and, and, and how that kind of tied into the overconfidence bias as well. Mm -hmm. um, the other thing we talked about from an overconfidence perspective is, is if an organization has, has a fairly good or, or decent um, security group that 
there there tends to be a, a, an overconfidence in the team members that, well, they'll fix it. If I click on this link or mm -hmm. they'll, they'll stop the bad things from happening. And that's not, uh, as many of us know, that's not always uh, the, the case. Absolutely. Yeah. And thinking about the team and the tools is really important that you need to have good processes and systems. It's not simply not to get the team to trust the team and get the tools. All right. And the last group that didn't go was a note taker for that. Do you know who was in the group? Sorry, I can't, I, I wasn't sure if our group already went. Uh, sure, let me, so this is group with Karen, Kemi, Melissa, Sandra, and Tim. I guess that's us. <laughs> I guess that's um, you. Yeah, so we talked about a couple of things. Uh, one was, um, you know, the a bias about where um, you may have uh, contracted workers at, mm -hmm. um, like certain countries are definitely um, mm -hmm. considered higher risk to do business in. Um, yeah. And then you also talked about um, how you may be doing interviews and such. And I think somebody already mentioned this, um, where you may have a bias where you like somebody because, you know, they, you have something in common, you know, you mm -hmm. see that they have some same interests as you do or, and, and then maybe your interview skills will, or questions may change um, based on, on uh, how reliable or how likable you think that mm -hmm. person would be. Yeah. Yeah, the interviews, and we talked about that a lot, it's definitely an issue with a halo effect and horns effect can be a serious problem. Excellent, everyone. So this is a good time to take our first break. So please be back in 15 minutes, half past hour. All right, everyone. See you then.
Yeah. Hey, Valerie. <laughs> okay. Yeah, just a quick one. Um, I was talking to Patrick, and he said I should uh, reach out to you that um, you have worked with him on an advanced consultation before. Yeah, yeah. so I don't know what the process is. Um, I know that there is a workflow in KShare that I'll need to fill out. But you know, in the meeting itself, what kind of questions will I be asking? Like. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Do you still have the text that he that you yeah, if you can share that with me, that would be great. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. 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 All right. Thank you. Okay. Yeah. Bye. We'll be starting in about two minutes. Starting in about two minutes. Thirty more seconds, and then we'll start up.
All right, everyone. Hope you're all back. So I wanted to start, uh, let's see. checking out the messages. Okay, thank you for those who sent me the messages. Jenny, not sure what's up with the presentation being upside down with a thank you. I don't think I, other people have that. So you might want to leave the and come back into the meeting. Hopefully that will reset whatever's going on. Okay, so. I wanted to start the meeting by something. I, I was just taking a quick look on my local news app during the break. And so I saw this news piece that root insurance executive sentenced for embezzling 10 million from Columbus based company, which is root insurance. And so what did this guy do? Uh, he entered into multiple contracts with marketing vendors and instructed them to divert their contract proceeds into his account. And so he embezzled over 10 million from Root. And so we see that this happens at the huge levels. This is an $8 million embezzlement from a pretty sizable company, Root Insurance. And they did not do appropriate auditing clearly if he was able to get away from this for over a year. So pretty bad, pretty bad. And so this is the kind of stuff that we want to avoid. And that's people who are not having appropriate auditing practices. That's the kind of problems that they will run into. Now, let me start the next section by sharing a little video. And this is from The Simpsons, and it's about the future and how we think about the future. And so check this out. I, I think, yes, you should be able to hear the sound. So I'm start the video right now. And it's a very brief one. Bam. That's a problem for future Homer. Man, I don't envy that guy. <laughs> So let's talk about how we think about the future. Let's see. And there's a tendency called hyperbolic discounting. So hyperbolic discounting is a serious problem that we run into, where we perceive the short-term future as more important than the long-term future. Just like Homer perceives the short-term future benefit of drinking that beer in the mayonnaise can as being better than the long-term future. We tend to underestimate our future selves. So thinking about our future selves, we tend to underestimate and undervalue our future selves and give them short shrift, focus way too much on the short term. And so you know the term technology debt, the same thing refer refers to, you might've heard the term security debt, auditing debt, compliance debt, where there's way too little resources focused on this because of the desire to take shortcuts and not invest sufficiently into these important areas. So it leads us to really prioritize the short term to the detriment of the long term, build up that security debt, that risk management debt, that compliance debt. And this underestimates the importance of long-term outcomes and impacts. And so I want you to think about where and how this might be playing a negative role in your own work. So take a minute to just think about and write down where this might play, well, 30 seconds since, uh, since you already know how to do this. Take 30 seconds to write down where this might be playing a negative role in your own work, in IT, auditing, cybersecurity, whatever you're doing, 
focusing on the short term, this hyperbolic discounting. By the way, the term hyperbolic discounting is about excessive hyperbolic discounting. That's where it comes from. So go ahead, take 30 seconds to write that down. Okay, everyone. So I hope you are ready and took notes. Let's go on to the next point, confirmation bias. So confirmation bias, if you've heard of any cognitive biases, you've probably heard of this one. It's really well known, where our instinct is to see through rose-colored glasses. So we tend to confirm our own beliefs. If we feel we are good at security if we feel that someone is not is going to have problems when we audit them if we believe that we don't need to worry about looking at this insurance executive and making sure that they are not pocketing money directing money to their own pocket and that we don't need any procedures to check in on them then we'll tend to not look for that information and in fact, we'll reject information that challenges our beliefs. So let's say we hear about a cybersecurity incident in another company. We'll tend to ignore that information. We'll tend to think that, well, it can never happen here. So confirmation bias is a serious issue and causes a lot of problems for a lot of companies. So please go ahead and think about where the confirmation bias might be a problem for your company. Go ahead and take 30 seconds to write that down. Please go ahead. Okay, now for this 
next segment, I'll show you a video. When you watch this video, your goal will be to count the number of times the players playing the players wearing white pass the ball. So again, count the number of times that the players wearing white pass the ball. Let's check it out. The monkey business illusion. Count how many times the players wearing white pass the ball. The correct answer is 16 passes. Did you spot the gorilla? For people who haven't seen or heard about a video like this before, about half missed the gorilla. If you knew about the gorilla, you probably saw it. But did you notice the curtain changing color or the player on the black team leaving the game? Let's rewind and watch it again. Here comes the gorilla, and there goes a player, and the curtain is changing from red to gold. When you're looking for a gorilla, you often miss other unexpected events. And that's the monkey business illusion. Learn more. Okay, so. Where is your attention? This is a serious problem for us, that our attention tends to be, unfortunately, not focused on the things where it really matters. So I want to ask you what you, elements you saw in this video. Did you see the gorilla? Did you see nothing? Gorilla and the player leaving the game? Gorilla and the curtain changing color? Or did you see all three? Please go ahead and vote. See, most people voted. Let's give five more seconds to share your thoughts about what you saw in the video. Okay, so we see that about a quarter of the people saw nothing. Great. So that's nice. That's usually when I present to soccer members, they tend to be more attentive than the typical person who watches the video, which is about half Mr. Gorilla. And if you haven't heard about or seen a video like this with the soccer, I definitely see that people are more attentive. And about 40% saw only the Gorilla. Then 20% saw the Gorilla and the player leaving the game. Just over 10% saw the Gorilla and the curtain changing color. And impressively, 7% of you saw everything. That's great. So again, that's pretty unusual. It's usually it's something like one or 2%. So, or, and folks don't see that. So great, you did definitely better than the typical uh, groups that I present, even better than typical saga group to which I present. But as we see, only 7% of the people saw everything. And most people saw the plurality, the majority of people, so the plurality of people saw the gorilla, the majority of people either saw nothing or the gorilla. And so where's your attention? There's cognitive bias called the attentional bias, where we tend to pay attention to the most emotionally salient aspects of our environment. Sometimes we'll just focus on counting the numbers. Many people will see the gorilla. It is pretty big and imposing, and it's emotionally salient. In the savannah environment, it was important for us to see those sorts of threats. So we might pay attention to something that's really very noticeable security threat, but we will often not pay attention to 
will pay too much attention to the most visible threats or most visible opportunities and ignore critical elements of the context. We miss less visible key threats and opportunities. For example, I was just doing a strategic plan facilitation for a company called Norpac Fisheries Export based out of Honolulu, Hawaii. So I just literally came back yesterday uh, from a red eye flight. I was up for, gosh, it was, yeah, it was about about 40 hours. So that was not fun going home, but, but Hawaii was fun. So I'm glad I got the chance to go there. The key there is talking about compliance, right? Compliance as an element of uh, human factors. So the company was, of course, they have to look at compliance. Do they do fish export, as you can guess from the name? And fish export is a major area that they have to pay attention to in compliance. And so something that they they were doing compliance and that was something that, basic, that they're focusing on as something, okay, yes, we have to do this, I guess, just because this, this, this gets us over, this is like a, a loss leader, a cost center, this compliance area. But as part of strategic planning, one thing we, the company realized from my facilitation that is that compliance doesn't have to be a cost center. It can be a differentiator. It can be an actual profit center because if they brand themselves as being super compliant and super safe and with all this MSC, not simply dolphin safe, but a higher level of compliance and security and so and where they can really focus on regulatory enforcement as an opportunity where they can get ahead of other companies in the seafood business that treat compliance and regulatory enforcement issues as just a challenge, something that they have to solve. But this company, if they treat it as an opportunity, then they can brand themselves as very safe and help their customers help really sell to high value customers like Costco, Walmart, and so on, which really don't want any issues with safety and compliance. They really want, they are very risk averse. So this company can focus in the next five years for their strategic plan on making compliance a major differentiating factor that that will really help them be stand out in the marketplace and help them sell to large customers. And that's not something that they were thinking about. They were thinking previously paying not paying attention to compliance. And now they'll be really paying attention to compliance. But that's only after we scanned the environment and saw that, hey, this is something that they can get a lot of benefit out of. So it's about what you pay attention to, what you focus on. And there are lots of things that we need to think about with IT security auditing and focus on that we don't focus on sufficiently because we only focus on the big obvious things. And so please take 30 seconds to write down where focusing more on with our attention on various aspects of the human factors of security, risk management, and compliance might be beneficial for you, your company, your team. So please go ahead, take 30 seconds to write that down.
All right, everyone. Let's go on. So I want to talk about a pair of cognitive biases known as the optimism bias and the pessimism bias. The optimism bias and the pessimism bias. What are these about? So the optimism bias and the pessimism bias are kind of like they sound. Optimism bias has to do with people who are optimistic, who see the grass as green on the other side of the hill, who see the glass as half full. And this is not a binary, this is a range, so it's you're not it's going to be going from extremely optimistic to strongly optimistic to moderately optimistic to moderately pessimistic, extremely to moderately pessimistic, so strongly pessimistic and extremely pessimistic. Or if you don't like the word pessimistic, you can use the word realistic. Same thing. People use the word realistic, but of course they mean pessimistic. Now, I tend to be strongly optimistic. And this is definitely part of my personality. People in auditing, security, compliance, IT, tend to be more pessimistic or realistic, if you prefer that terminology which is natural, that's people, they are risk averse. But with optimistic people like me, we tend to be more opportunity oriented, entrepreneurial and creative, but we tend to be too risk blind. So I would not be a good person to go into security and compliance risk management just because that's not my personality. People who have a pessimism bias, again, not far from all, but more people in risk management, IT, and security tend to have more of a pessimistic bent, pessimistic bias, or realistic, if you prefer that terminology. They're great, and they have many strengths. You have many strengths at managing threats, at being stabilizing the situation, at improving the situation. But people tend to be too risk averse. They see the glass is half empty. The grass is yellow on the other side of the hill. And it's really important to know how to work together effectively because you need at least two of each on your team to be highly effective. Without sufficient number of optimists, you won't have enough innovation and creativity. Without sufficient number of pessimists, you'll tend to run in too many different directions and you'll make too many mistakes. You won't improve most situations sufficiently. You won't implement situations well, ideas well. So for example, as an optimist, I tend to wake up in the morning and I have 20 ideas and they're all brilliant, or at least they feel brilliant. I've learned to my chagrin that they're far from all actually brilliant. And so I make sure to give my 20 brilliant ideas to a pessimist I have on my team who I trust to evaluate ideas. And the pessimist will say, well, these are all half-baked potatoes, but maybe these three are worth finishing baking. And they'll work on fixing the flaws of these ideas. They'll throw out 17 ideas and they'll focus on the three remaining ones, which they have flaws that I don't see. And they'll work on fixing the flaws and implementing the ideas. That's their strength as a pessimist. And so that's great. That's a great way of collaborating together. And so when you think about teams collaborating together, I've seen too many teams where optimists are just generating ideas and pessimists are just shooting them down. That is not a helpful collaboration. What you really need to do is to separate those activities. Otherwise, optimists get known as people who shoot from the hip, but pessimists get known as Mr. No or Mrs. No. Instead, what you need to do is have optimists generate ideas and then pass them on to pessimists to evaluate. That needs to be not the typical brainstorming where the optimist creates ideas and the pessimists try to create ideas, but they're not very good at it, and they create like whole bunch, you know, uh, they create one idea for each idea that optimists create, but then the optimists fight to defend their ideas. That's not good. The optimists need to generate ideas and then pass them on to pessimists, and then pessimists would evaluate their ideas. That's a much, much better combination and a much more effective one. And that's how teams can get along much more successfully. Now in the chat, someone asks, can a single person be both with optimism in one situation, pessimism in a different context? You can't really be both. It's like saying, well, I'm a perfect ambivert with you know using my left hand and right hand effectively, or I'm in the middle of an extroversion and introversion. It's going to be a very, very small fraction of people who are going to be exactly in the middle. But so you'll have a natural predisposition. 
if you naturally in your everyday life, if you see the glasses half full, you'll tend to be optimistic. If you see the glasses half empty, you'll tend to be pessimistic. Now, there are situations where people who are moderately optimistic or moderately pessimistic, they, if they engage with people who are extremely optimistic or extremely pessimistic, they can play the other role. They can play the devil's advocate in either direction. So if they're extremely, someone with extremely pessimistic and you are moderately pessimistic, you will more naturally tend to display a little bit of optimism in comparison to this person. So it's going to be a comparative situation. You can also do that in a team context. If you, the, your team tends to be way too pessimistic, strongly pessimistic or extremely pessimistic, and you're only moderately pessimistic, you might express yourself in, in a somewhat optimistic by comparison to the rest of the team, just to pull along and share different ideas. So it, it's about where you're located on that spectrum. But you will not be, if you're objectively judging the spectrum by comparison to the rest of the population, you will be wherever you want. And you can learn to express more optimistic or more pessimistic sides when you're in the context with different people. And also you can learn it over time. So I learned about myself that I'm strongly optimistic. And having learned that about myself, I can take steps to question that side of me, to say, okay, I tend to really underestimate threats. So after I generate ideas, I'm going to specifically know that likely my ideas are going to be full of flaws and risks and problems that I can't see. One way I can address that is give it to someone who, are, who is pessimistic. So that's a deliberate way of saying you evaluate them. Another way is for me to sit down and go against my intuitions and say, let me take the time to evaluate what might be the flaws and the risks of each idea. So that's something you can't do. But that requires you to go against your intuition, to go against that cognitive bias that's internalized within you and to address them. Cool. Any more questions? Hope that answers the question. Okay. So, so this is two cognitive biases. Please take a minute to write down where the optimism bias and the pessimism bias might be impacting your work. So please go ahead, take a minute to write that down. All right, good. Let's move on. So 
this is the last cognitive bias I want to talk about. It's kind of focusing on the ones that are specifically relevant to the human factors of security compliance and risk management. It's the empathy gap. So that has to do with underestimating the impact of emotions on our decisions. I talked before about how emotions determine 80 to 90% of our decisions when we just go ahead and do what comes naturally to us. But we really underestimate the importance of emotions on other people as well as ourselves. So emotions under determine the large majority of our own decisions and the large majority of other people's decisions. We greatly underestimate the importance of our own emotions and other people's emotions. We tend to assume that we and they are rational decision makers, and we fail to predict their decisions and behaviors. This is, I mean, comes up in security compliance, risk management way too often. We're thinking about risk management. It, we tend to think that, well, why didn't that person manage these risks? Why didn't root insurance manage the risks of that, you know, that executive? Why didn't we manage, why didn't we have appropriate compliance? They should have obviously followed that protocol. Why didn't we have appropriate security? Why are people walking into the door after someone? Uh, why do they let someone after? The, why do they badge themselves in and they let somebody else go in after them instead of closing the door and making that person badge in? And they let these people into the room. Why does that happen? Well, we tend to underestimate issues around social awkwardness, around status around how people feel, around anger, around anxiety, around the resentment, around frustration, how uncomfortable it would feel to close a door behind you and these little niceties that we practice that seriously underestimate security, physical security, all sorts of security. Why do we underestimate the likelihood that of spear phishing? Why do they, so many people get caught and pay out ransom? This is, and get bank accounts changed. Why does that happen? I mean, just since it's on my mind, the company with Norpac Fisheries expert oh, experts, they had someone who in the past couple of years, they had a major incident of 350,000. They lost 350,000 or their customer lost 350,000. They said back and forth, with lawyers and legal stuff where their bank account was changed and they wired the money to the wrong place. Pretty typical, right? Happens all the time. But why does it happen? Well, about it's a, that the accountant who changed the bank account felt awkward about getting in touch with the person who asked for the bank account changed. So that was as a result of awkwardness. They just didn't get in touch and they changed the bank account. And so this is about feelings, it's about emotions, it's, and we underestimate the emotions in other people's decision-making. And so this is a serious threat in the hum, as a human factor in IT security and compliance. So please take 30 seconds and write down where the empathy gap, underestimating the impact of our own emotions and other people's emotions, might be playing a negative role in security, compliance, auditing in your own work, risk management.
All right, everyone. Hopefully you took those notes. Let's go on to how can we overcome decision-making error. So this is the second part of the presentation. Let's talk about overcoming these dangerous judgment errors to make good decisions. What can we do? We need to go against our intuitions. We need to go against what we feel. This is difficult to do naturally, to go against your intuitions, but it's very valuable. Remember, our intuitions evolved to help early humans survive. The fight or flight response, tribalism, all of that evolved to help humans, early humans survive. In the modern world, that's quite dangerous. Our brains aren't really wired to make good decisions in today's complex world. Think about another area that you've probably worked hard to address in your own life, food. In the savanna environment, in that ancient savanna, we had food, we needed to, when we came across a source of sugar, like honey, bananas, apples, we needed to consume as much of it as possible. We need to be strongly triggered by sugar because that was our main limiting resource, calories. Calories were very important, value, valuable, and so in nature, evolution has caused us to be strongly triggered by sugar. In the modern environment, that's very problematic because we have a way overabundance of sugar and it's been highly processed to make it hyper palatable, to make it very, very delicious. In fact, I was listening to a podcast today oh, on the Huberman lab, so quite research-based podcast, where apparently even if you completely dull the mouth to make yourself unable to taste sugar, the gut, if once goes into your gut, we have specific organs in the gut that's, that can sense sugar. So it's not simply the sweet taste of sugar that will be triggering, but in the gut, the sugar will trigger us to pursue whatever food we just had once it gets into the gut. So it's really going to, it's a very, very powerful dynamic that's not simply about the sweetness of it. It's built into us on many levels, literally gut intuition. And so you've probably worked hard in your own life to address this sugar cravings. And I mean, it's certainly hard given how hyper palatable it is. And there's a reason that we have an obesity epidemic in the United States, but you know, those donuts, right? It's very tempting when you, let's say, a grateful vendor sends you some donuts to go into the break room and have maybe half a donut. And then you're kind of a little bit triggered and you don't want to leave the other half. So you eat the other half of the donut. And then you're much more triggered. And you need a second donut and a third donut. And before you know it, half the box is gone, right? Not that it ever happened to me. And so that's our intuition. Hopefully you've learned some strategies to address that. Maybe you've passed by those donuts and you go and you grab a delicious peach from a fruit bowl that another grateful vendor sent over to you that's in the break room. That's a way of addressing and your intuition, your gut instinct. In the same way, you need to address your instincts, your gut intuition on cognitive biases. You need to learn that cognitive biases are highly problematic for good decision-making and you need to learn to address them and prevent them from harming you and hurting your decisions. So let's talk about what is going on in terms of how we want to think about them when in terms of human factors. You want to be aware of your own emotions and other people's emotions and how in order to address these cognitive biases. So emotional intelligence has to do with being aware of and being able to manage your own emotions. And that is critical. So your gut intuitions around food, your gut intuitions around halo effect, horns effect, planning fallacy, overconfidence bias, attentional bias, all the other cognitive biases that we've talked about, confirmation bias and empathy gap, optimism bias, pessimism bias. You also have to have social intelligence, which is about being aware of and be able to manage and influence other people's emotions and relationships. And so, that's what the human factors are about in terms of security, compliance, risk management for auditing and IT professionals. Both emotional intelligence that's within you internally and social intelligence externally, other people. 
So let's talk about one tool that is often used to try to address some of these problems that has a lot of problems itself. You've heard about the SWOT analysis. So the SWOT analysis looks at the strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats. It's often, very often used within IT, auditing, security, strength, evaluations to address some of these problems. But the issue is if you don't account for cognitive biases in the SWOT analysis, it results in a false sense of comfort that causes serious problems for good decisions and plans. It, people tend to overestimate strengths and opportunities and underestimate weaknesses and threats. So this is a tool that has a lot of flaws and I don't recommend that you use this. I'll talk about some tools that are much more helpful. The first tool is awareness of these cognitive biases. And here, and I'll send you this after the presentation, you'll want to use the assessment that I will share with you about. It's an assessment on dangerous judgment errors in the workplace and cognitive biases. It looks at the 30 most dangerous cognitive biases in professional settings, evaluates their extent and impact in the workplace, and provides you with the next steps for addressing them. So let's take a look at what this tool looks like. Okay, so you should all see it now. Please bring up your chat uh, feature because we'll be using that. Okay, hopefully you brought that up. So let's take a look at the two. So description, it helps you evaluate the quality of judgment in your workplace, look at behavioral economics, cognitive neuroscience. What are the directions? The goal is to indicate how often a problem occurred. So it's about behaviors that are clearly observable, something that you can observe, tendencies that you can observe. Each of the questions has to do with an underlying cognitive bias, but you don't have to know anything about cognitive biases in order to use to take the assessment, which is very nice. So the answer to each question will be in percentage terms out of all the possible times the problem might have occurred in the past year. Think about your own observation, your own group, your own team, and what you can observe. You can think about the whole company, you can think about the department, depends on the size. I recommend that you think about what you're most familiar with in the company. Apply your evaluation to that. Don't overthink it, go with your initial impressions. Doesn't have to be precise. Each question should take 15 to 20 seconds. So let's think about question number one. What percentage of projects this missed the deadline or went over budget in the past year? In whatever you're thinking about. So please go ahead and put your answer to number one in the chat. So 20%, 75%, 50%. 90%, 70%, 90%, 30%, 25%, over 90 60 50 30 40 20 10 70 percent Excellent, 75 40%. So you're looking at this. If it's in the 10% range, of it's not too big of a deal. It's that's natural variance. It happens. If it's in the 10 to 20%, if it's in the 15 to 20% range, it becomes more of a moderate problem. If it's over 20%, if it's in the 30%, it becomes more of a serious problem. If it's over 30%, it's a very serious issue because then it speaks to systematic mismanagement of planning. You're not necessarily mismanaging resources, but you're mismanaging planning. And we talked about this, the planning fallacy being a serious issue. So this question is about the planning fallacy. It helps you understand how impactful, how present, how frequent the planning fallacy is for your organization. Let's go on to number two. What percentage of team conflicts, so conflicts within your team, thinking about all the team conflicts, what percentage of them occurred because someone on the team, at least one person, 
overestimated how effective they are in communicating and persuading others. So please go ahead when you're thinking about the reasons that team conflicts occurred. Okay, we have 100%, we have 50%, 99, 5%, 20, 20, 10, 5, 40, 10, 90, 95, 80%, 50%. Yeah, go ahead, please share it. Keep sharing. And so again, same logic applies. 5, 10%, not too much of a big deal. 15 to 20% becomes bigger deal. 25 to 30 becomes more of a serious issue. And over that, really serious issue. So this has to do with the illusion of transparency. The illusion of transparency has to do with us perceiving our own communication abilities as being much better than they actually are. So it's an illusion that we are much more transparent in what we communicate, that we communicate much more effectively than we actually do. And that causes team conflicts because we tend to overestimate the effectiveness of our communication skills and persuasiveness when we think that we are much more transparent, that our message is much more clear and effective than it actually is. All right, let's think about number three. Of all significant decisions, in what percentage of cases was someone, at least one person, involved in the decision, overconfident about the decision? Maybe they didn't gather enough data, they jumped to conclusions, they defended their idea too strongly. Oh, 90%, 10%, 30%, 40, 50, 20, 20, 100, 10, 25, 75, 50%, 20%. Yeah, go ahead, please go and 5%, 50, 50, 60%. So again, same logic applies to the extent and the seriousness of this issue. So this has to do with, of course, the overconfidence bias that we talked about. And overconfidence is a major, major problem. Let's get to number four. Of all situations when someone, at least one person, had evidence that would contradict their beliefs, or would disprove the inf their interpretation of the situation, in what percentage of cases did they ignore the evidence or misinterpret the information? 99%, 0%, mm -hmm. very big range, 15%, 18, 10, 0%, 50%, 10%, 10%, 30, 40, 80%, 10%, 20, 30, 80. So again, a variety of questions. So this has to do with the confirmation bias. So we talked about the confirmation bias it tends to be Pretty serious issue. Let's go on to number five. Thinking about situations when an individual or team had to deal with difficult and uncomfortable issues, but focused on trivial issues instead. I see this happening very frequently in audits where there's much more focus on, free, on trivial issues when there's uncomfortable issues that have to be dealt with. Also in security protocols, tend to focus too much on trivial issues when there's serious issues to deal with. And yes, that's kind of clear that some people are experiencing that. We have 75, 30, 50, 20, 75, 60, 90%, 50%, 70%. So this is a cognitive bias called Parkinson's law of triviality, also called bike shedding. And it's named bike shedding as a more colloquial name because there was a team that when they were building a nuclear reactor, they focused way too much of their time on the bike shed next to the nuclear reactor instead of the nuclear reactor itself, which is much more complex. <laughs> so this also the more frequently referred to as the law of triviality or Parkinson's law of triviality, which is named for the person who developed it. When the potential or current employee was evaluated, this is number six. In what percentage of the situations was the evaluation too positive due to factors not relevant to their job competency or organizational fit? So too positive an evaluation of an employee. We talked about we talked about hiring. That's going to be certainly an, an issue. Talked about promotions. That's going to be an issue. Okay, so let's see. 10%, 15%, 50%, 30%. Ten percent, forty percent, fifty, thirty, ten. So a little bit less of a problem than the other ones, and this has to do, of course, with the halo. And go ahead and keep sharing. This has to do with the halo effect. So the halo effect can be quite problematic.
let's go on to number eight. So I'm going to skip number seven because it's, that's about the horns effect, oh, which is the opposite of the halo effect. Eight of percentage of team conflicts that occurred because someone proposed ill-considered or insufficiently thought out ideas. So, okay, yeah, should have put number so number eight, but anyway. 80%, 50%, 70%, 20%, 7%, 50%, 30%, 40%, 90%. It's definitely a serious issue for a number of people. So this has to do with optimism bias, that people like me who tend to not sufficiently consider ideas and who tend to shoot from the hip. And again, because I'm aware, I can catch myself doing that occasionally, although it's still quite difficult to do. So optimism bias can be a serious problem. And of course, this is, has to do with the pessimism bias, number nine. Let's do number 10. So I'm gonna skip that. Um, of all times when someone could have passed up valuable but negative information up the chain of command, they failed to do so in what percentage of the cases? When people didn't pass up valuable negative information up the chain of command. 25%, 30%, 10, 5, 10, 25, 50, 25, 15, 10, 50, 40, 30. So this, I see this happening significant amount of times in auditing security compliance when people have negative information, but they don't want to pass up the chain of command due to some potential human factors that they don't want to deal with, relationship, status, and so on. It can be an issue. 60%, 40%, 30%. So this has to do with the shoot the messenger effect, where if you pass negative information up the chain of command in many companies, they will tend to shoot the messenger. So they will tend to criticize the messenger 80% instead of fixing the problem. So I'm not going to go through all of them right now. You, I'll send it to you. You can go through them yourself. So it'll have you go through the assessment. Then you can get a numerical score, give you directions for the score. You can figure out the impactfulness, moderate, slight, major, dangerous, catastrophic, then evaluation and revenue and expenses, and then look at competencies. So you can look at self-evaluations as one competency based on the number of questions. Evaluating others would be a few other questions. Then strategic evaluations, and finally operational evaluations. And then addressing judge, dangerous judgment errors. So you'll, to address the dangerous judgment errors, the uh, description will give you planning fallacy and what it results in. And so then you can know, okay, this is what I should watch out for. Second, again, talks about the illusion of transparency and the problems that you can watch out for. Overconfidence. So you can failing to address threats or failing to take advantage of opportunities, and each of which might have been recognized with additional information gathered before making the decision. So this gives you specific next steps to address each of the problems. Confirmation bias, launching pet projects that harm profitability, failing to address behaviors that lead to lawsuits, giving due considerations to suggestions that would improve the bottom line and other problems. So you could see the kind of benefits that would result from taking the assessment. So let's do a poll. We haven't done a poll for a while. So let's do a poll on how valuable do you think the assessment would be for you and your team to take it to help you address and cover and then address the cognitive biases that the assessment uncovers. Please go ahead and vote. See, three quarters of you participated. Five more seconds to talk about the value of the assessment. Share your thoughts about the value. Sandy so says, you don't see the poll. I'm not sure why the large majority of folks see it and voted. 
and we see the answer. So again, everyone find this valuable in some extent. Over a third of you found this highly valuable and two thirds found it moderately valuable. Excellent. So now it's the time for you to take a minute this time and write down where and how you might be able to use the assessment, taking it yourself, having the team take it to address notice and address the cognitive biases that might be causing a problem for your organization. So please go ahead, take a minute to do so. Write it down. Okay, everyone. So at this point, I want to ask you for any questions about the first part of the presentation, the cognitive biases and the assessment before we get into breakout groups. So questions for the first part of the presentation and breakout groups before we get into breakout groups. You can unmute yourself or you can put your questions into the chat. Happy to do it either way. Mm. Yeah. Don't see questions? Great. Okay. Then what we'll do next is we'll get into breakout rooms. What I want you to talk about is the last several cognitive biases and the assessment. So the last several cognitive biases and the assessment. Start talking about the assessment, and then to the extent that you have time left over, talk about the cognitive biases. So focus, again, start with the assessment to the extent that you have time, talk about the cognitive biases. Talk about how you can leverage the assessment to learn about yourself, about the cognitive biases that might be most impactful for your workplace, and then think about how you can present it to your teams if you think it might be valuable to encourage them to take the assessment and address the cognitive biases it uncovers. So questions about what we'll be doing. Okay, great, no questions. So again, when you start, Choose a note taker. Note takers, please note the rooms. 
in which you are going to be taking the notes. So take note the rooms. So start by selecting a note taker, note taker notes the rooms, and then have the discussion. Focus first on the assessment, how you can leverage it yourself to learn about cognitive biases and then help your team do so. And then to the time you left over, talk about the several of the cognitive biases that we discussed, the confirmation bias, attentional bias, optimism and pessimism bias, and the empathy gap. All right, I'm going to open the rooms now. Please go ahead.
Was there a question in this? Hey, one? Yeah, there was. What what was can you just repeat the specific first question? We caught, you know, if time allows, talk about the other biases, which I think yeah, the assessment. The, so the the first question was how can you use the assessment effectively to learn about the cognitive biases in your own work, what you're doing, and how so by yourself, learn about those cognitive biases. And the and secondly, learn about think about where you can use the assessment to present it to your teams with which you work with and encourage them to take the assessment to learn about how cognitive biases might be impacting their work. Okay, great. Th yeah, that was perfect. Thank you. Excellent. You're welcome. All right. Okay. All right, everyone. Good. So let's go with group one. What kind of insights did you have starting with the assessment? And if you had time to talk about the other cognitive biases, talk about that. I apologize. I don't know which group I was in. Um, is there a way for me to figure that out now that I'm back out of my group? <laughs> I have the oh, same problem. We don't know which group we're from. Okay, well, it should have said which group uh, you were in. That's why I asked folks to. Yeah, I'm note, sorry. Uh, I didn't pay attention no. to that on the screen. I apologize. Well, oh, uh, I think I'm like group five. So, what did uh, you say, who, Todd? She was looking at a monkey. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay, I think okay. I'm five, so, so I'll wait my turn. So, okay, so Todd was in group two. And so whoever was in group with Todd, that was group two. Jennifer, you were in group 10. So group one. Group one had Christopher Brown, Helen Zell, Hema Anavati, Joan LaCroix, okay. and Richard Allen. I, I, I think we weren't group one last time, but I'm happy to go as group yes. one. Good, okay. Yeah. 
Um, so we, we had some good conversation. We talked about personal and department biases. And um, it was interesting because um, personally, when you're working in a department and you're leading an area, you think, oh, I'm doing this fine and, and whatever. But then you get your, uh, we have a number of different types of feedback we get. We use um, in, in my company, entrepreneurial operating system. So you get 360s and quarterly conversations where you get to tell your boss what's working and what's not working. And then mm -hmm. another person said that they have 3030s where you have immediate kind of a discussion about what went well, well what we can mm -hmm. do better. But the things that are interesting is when you get your 360s where your team reviews you, mm. and they might That's call out helpful. something you're completely unaware of. Yeah. And um, likewise, you get to do your manager, and this is meant to be in an unretaliatory mm -hmm. Uh, manner. And then sure. another thing that balances that out is the DEI initiatives where you make sure like if you have uh, different types of learners on your team, you're, you know, cognizant of that. If you have someone who has a different native language to begin with. Mm -hmm. So you have to make sure you're cognizant of that. Um, and then there's various trainings that people talked about. There's also location bias where yeah. People might be more affin, you know, have more affinity to someone who they work in person with versus mm -hmm. a remote group that always works remotely. Sure. So there's tons of, um, uh, and then one more that one of the guys brought up um, is maybe the manager of a group might have a completely different experience. The the timing that they came up in their career, the circumstances and challenges, mm. and today that career path might be completely different. And then Richard. Yeah. I would like to call on Richard because he had an example with a cat and I and we got cut off. So I don't know if Richard, you want to share it? If he'll come forward if he's too shy. Richard Allen, do you want to share? Well, it was good. I we just didn't get to finish it. So I'll no mute worries. and let the next person go. Leave Thank you, Joe. Appreciate about, it. About a cat or a dog. You know, what is the bias? <laughs> <laughs> That's funny. Well, go ahead, Todd. Uh, so your group two, you share. So uh, we were talking, we, we talked about confirmation bias. And uh, even in terms of the relationship between an auditor and your technical teams, and sometimes mm -hmm. the bias of this is an assumption that can, uh, the technical teams can come in and think, oh, they're just an auditor. They're not going to understand the mm -hmm. tech, the tech behind it. Um, making some assumptions about, uh, you know, the auditors or, or what yeah. have you. And then even using past experiences or thinking that that relationship should be adversarial, mm -hmm. uh, when often you can, you know, I've been on both sides of uh, the auditor side and, and also sure. on the cybersecurity side. And mm. how can we take one group that is trying to push forward to get initiatives done and things like that, but also mm -hmm. another group that is helping to look at uh, are there potential gaps or mm -hmm. risks or things that are going to, and how can we actually work together? And that's always, a, that's always a bit of a challenge, right? Because again, going yeah. back to your optimist versus, versus pessimist or realistic mm -hmm. um, and that you can make it if, if done properly, you can actually make it an advocacy is that, Hey, Mm -hmm. We're looking at our audit, our either external or internal auditing teams um, in that light. But even that there's some conflict between even internal audit and external audit, how they mm -hmm. look at things. And so there can be sure. some biases there. Um, I think one of the things that I've learned just personally, I can be more optimistic also. And mm -hmm. um, but then I appreciated I had a team member for close to 20 years and he's very pessimistic. But mm -hmm. quite honestly, we worked well together because he would he would come up with the more accurate uh, mm -hmm. estimation on how yeah. many resources, what it's going to take, what the actual yeah. outcome is going to be, and to help temper some of the hey, let's charge mm -hmm. for it and get something done. So yeah, it was a good relationship. Excellent. And uh, wanted to add about the different sides of the aisle there's often a lack of empathy. So thinking about the empathy gap. So thinking yes. about the, that is also important. Just want to highlight that. Absolutely. Thank you, Todd. You're welcome. Excellent. 
And so, uh, by the way, in the chat, you could see that the room number does show the top of the window where Zoom meeting shows up. So keep that in mind for the next chat, uh, the next uh, group activity for you to keep in mind which group you're in. Talking about groups, number three, group three. Okay, so um, mm -hmm. in our group, we really talked about a couple of things. One of the one was about the process of con uh, conducting the assessment, right? So, mm -hmm. so we we were kind of wondering, <laughs> you know, do we do we just guess the percentages, or is that an objective method mm -hmm. to determine what the actual biases are? So that was one of the questions. And then sure. the other question that we kind of talked about was, well, you know, if we were doing this guessing method, then then mm -hmm. you know, this optimistic pessimistic people would kind of skew our assessment, mm -hmm. right? So, sure. you know, somebody might say, uh, I'm 100% sure we are really, mm -hmm. really good versus the other person might say, oh, no, I'm 100% sure we suck, right? So mm -hmm. so, so that, that was one of the things. The other other thing that, that Shirley brought up, which was really, really uh, important was that, um, you know, some companies may require an objective assessment, or I, I think Tim mm -hmm. mentioned that, you know, that some companies may require objective assessment versus other companies may be more lenient and say, okay, well, mm -hmm. you know, let's do, let's do a, a, a just an open assessment, right? Uh, because, mm -hmm. our, uh, you know, more trusting, more open uh, culture, et cetera, et cetera, right? Yeah. Uh, and then, and then Shirley kind of brought up the, 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 the fact that HR would be an idle organization to conduct bias training, right? Because mm -hmm. they know more about, you know, the, the, the humans within the organization. Uh, and uh, another thing was that an assessment requires a strong leader to be able to manage all these different personalities, right? Sure. Uh, because of all the different, you know, quote unquote, you know, cognitive biases or different types of biases that that, that have to be managed through mm -hmm. the assessment. And and finally, the one thing that 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 Tim mentioned was that you know before doing an assessment, it might be a good idea to gather some statistics or data points, uh, mm -hmm. so that that you know the, the assessment can be focused, right? Um, yeah. And then and then finally, you know, as mentioned earlier, right? Some parts of the company like IT may be very optimistic about getting stuff done, but then they realize, mm -hmm. oh, we don't have the budget, we don't have the time, etc. But you know, they, they went into the, the battle or gung ho and then realized, oh, we don't have any ammunition, right? So mm -hmm. so these are some of the things that 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 we discussed. Excellent. Excellent discussion. Uh, very useful one here. Thank you. Uh, great. For in terms of the objective, yeah, the assessment is going to be most of the questions are going to be subjective because you have to assess what happened and behaviors. Some of the things like percentage of projects that went over budget or over time, you can much more objectively measure. So it really depends on the questions, but most of the questions will be subjective and that's fine. That's The goal is not to get the perfect answer. The goal is to discover which issues might be problematic. And then you can use that to go ahead next time and evaluate okay, what changed, if anything, based on any interventions that we did? Good. Number four, group four. All right, so group four, um, mm -hmm. we determined everyone has biases and classifications. We're pretty new to most of the group. Um, mm -hmm. Probably one of the biggest takeaways is finding time to do assessments when you're sure. busy putting out daily fires. Mm -hmm. um, Personality types are always interesting. Personalities above principles, mm -hmm. but personalities still play into the role. And communication styles and perceptions in different generations can be highly impactful. Um, there are different groups and the way they communicate and interact can be completely different. Uh, but there's always a form of managing some kind of group dynamic, regardless of the age or gender. Um, we also talked about strong leaders. Uh, oftentimes, strong leaders can take over. We have a lot mm -hmm. of yes man or yes woman employees that are just people yeah. pleasers. They're just going to answer the question and do the work because they're asked to. Um, we did look at how people work. A lot of times mm -hmm. that can uh, eliminate other biases, even though work ethic may change between different groups or different dynamics. Okay. Um, Online, as mentioned, online versus face-to-face, -face, um, it's different. Um, some employees sure. grew up on an online training, but uh, mm -hmm. prior to, um, you know, the pandemic, uh, auditing was never done remotely. It was always done yeah. in-house. Now things have changed. You know, it's a different yep. dynamic, different work group. Uh, 
higher risks are focused on the different problems. Uh, oftentimes we just focus on the problem because we're in a high risk, like an audit team. If we're looking at a fraud department or law enforcement, there's built in biases because of the environment and how they function. Um, parenting kind of, you know, as a parent, you all right, what's going on in there? You guys are being too quiet. You know, it's, uh, <laughs> we have those standard built in biases because we know we're looking for specific content. So <laughs> That's kind of what we can do. Okay. Really good discussion. Excellent. Thank you, Brian. And uh, talking about the, the putting out the fires, I think one of the important things to realize is that well, not having time to take the assessment is and do get bias training, cognitive bias training, is that by getting taking the assessment and doing cognitive bias training, you'll prevent a lot of fires. So that is the an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure, like Brent Franklin said. And that's a really useful way of thinking about it. You want to prevent a lot of problems? That's when you do the assessment. And that's what you are here for to look at the cognitive biases and prevent a lot of problems before they occur. Okay. Thank you, Brian. In the room five. Nice. Um, we basically stayed on the assessment and what we talked Great. about the whole time. And um, a couple of ideas were tossed out. One of them was for me that um, I have a fairly small team and the team is going to be growing. But let mm -hmm. each team member take the assessment yeah. and see if we even agree how we're working mm -hmm. together and mm -hmm. see and see if there's differences and maybe talk and talk through those. Mm -hmm. um, an another thing was then asking some peers to take it and evaluate mm. that, evaluate our team to see if there's a lot of differences. Yeah. And then somebody else said that um, we really need to bring in, you know, if we want to do that, bring in management, let management know that we're trying to do these things mm -hmm. just so that everybody knows that, hey, we're trying to evaluate our team to see how we're working effectively yeah. and that. So we really just talked, really talked about Great. how we could use it and mm -hmm. use who should do the assessment. And of course, as other people have brought up, this isn't something that's going to take five minutes, you know, yes. to really do and to really think about and to put it together. So that was basically, a, we just really went back and forth with that stuff. Okay, excellent. Sounds like a really great discussion. And mm -hmm. it's definitely valuable to have the team members take the assessment. So I mentioned the strategic planning that's really on my mind. As part of the strategic planning, I always have the leadership team take the assessment beforehand. And it was really interesting, the score difference between the CEO and the other managers. So for example, on the planning fallacy, the first question, the other managers had relatively low scores and the CEO had something like 70 and they had something like 20 to 30 because they were looking at uh, stuff happening within their own departments. But the CEO mm -hmm. was looking at what was happening across the company as a whole, especially important major projects. And the important major projects, they were not getting done because they were cross-departmental projects. And whereas within each project, within each domain of each individual manager of the company, the things were going relatively fine. But the cross-departmental projects that the CEO was really respons kind of responsible mm -hmm. for, there was technically responsible for it, except the CEO, those were not getting moving forward. And so we discovered that there was not enough cross-departmental collaboration. So we ended up forming task forces devoted to each project rather than having the CEO be sort of the project manager for the cross-departmental projects and them not moving forward as a result. So that's the kind of stuff that you can discover with different people have seeing the elephant, different parts of the elephant, right? Good. Moving on to room six. Okay, team six also focused on confirmation bias. We talked mm -hmm. about how teams may not proactively look at what's going on because in their mm -hmm. eyes, everything's just working fine. Um, and then there's always a gap yeah. around looking at what we know and are comfortable with, but not pushing the threshold in any way, like how, mm -hmm. where do we improve? How do we get better? Uh, we also talked about That's hyperbolic discounting and mm -hmm. um, the fact that urgent issues take priority without a full consideration of long-term planning mm -hmm. and how it would affect, you know, for example, privacy. Uh, Good point. Um, mm -hmm. We also talked a little bit about empathy gaps. And for example, if someone specifically like C-suite and titles, they may not know mm -hmm. everything and specifics or be able to drive risk in a certain way. 
So it's important yeah. to actually put your own voice on it. Uh, we actually started with this, but just to end it off, uh, we talked a little bit about the bias survey and just felt that it would be beneficial and help in people's mind about what they've potentially never considered. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Yeah, that's kind of a goal to think, get them thinking about what they never considered. Good. Thank you. I appreciate that, Tanya. All right. Room seven. Hello. Hey, uh, we started off talking. Hi. We started talking about the survey and how mm -hmm. we found it valuable. Um, but then it also reminded me of some team building groups I've been in before and mm -hmm. how valuable really good facilitator to really tease out some of these issues mm -hmm. and talk about solutions with them are. So going beyond just the, the initial awareness to really try to get to root cause and some problem yeah. solving. And so then we moved, yeah, then we moved on to talking about the gorilla mm -hmm. and the attention bias and how um, one of the team members actually it was their first time taking it and actually saw the gorilla. So that was impressive. Cool. Because I didn't the first time, hmm. but um, it did remind me of um, one thing at work right now is we've been doing uh, voice of the customers to understand mm -hmm. tools. And we're so focused on fixing the tools that mm -hmm. what we're finally really uncovering is it's not a tool issue. It's a process issue. Oh. So now we're going to have to convince our leaders that we've got a process problem, not a tool mm -hmm. problem. and we can't fix it with a tool. So we had a good discussion around that. Then we moved on to the, the hyper one I can never remember the name of. Hyperbolic discounting. Yes, that one. And um, talked about firefighting, that we're so focused mm. on firefighting that there's no time to actually do the real work or the, mm -hmm. the fires were put out are not once we get them put out we realize they weren't that big or that important and we should have been working on other things mm -hmm. and that there's no, they were so focused on firefighting there's no time to do root cause or actually fix fix it so it doesn't happen again and that's it excellent sounds like a very healthy and extensive discussion very helpful great thank you very much susan going on to roommate yep. All right, for roommate, um, mm -hmm. talked about a little bit about how to use the assessment mm -hmm. to learn about the bias going on. Um, and if I remember correctly, the, some of the questions came across as almost after the fact, you know, after things have happened, then mm -hmm. you take the, the assessment and, and rate how it went or give the percentage of how many conflicts or whatever it was. But, you know, it... it and it is important, obviously, because our assumptions and bias are what really hinders us. But I'm thinking in terms of if, if we could spend that assessment. And, and again, I didn't spend time looking through the whole thing. But if we could use sure. that before something starts, hmm. before a major project starts, you know, send it around cross-functional, all the different teams involved. So we can understand, you know, their their thoughts, um, where where what they're thinking, where they think a problem is going to occur, because I think that's going to be very enlightening to all the teams so we can be very conscious of each other and, and um, try to address all the problems up front. Mm -hmm. So that, that was that was the assessment. And then just mm -hmm. talking about two of the of the different types, um, hyperbolic discounting. A good example that that came to mind is um, Artificial intelligence, obviously, that's a big topic, buzzword, you know, big sure. initiatives for, for all companies, really. But when we don't put too much focus on AI because we feel it's a security issue. So, mm. like, the security department itself may think, whoa, no, the answer is no, we're not going to allow mm. it. Um, but in doing that, we discount the importance of, of it in the long term. So, yeah. so. Whereas we should be putting a lot of time and energy up front, figuring out how to make it work securely instead of, you know, how it's just going to be a big security risk. Hmm. So, I mean, that, that, that's, that, that's a realistic take on it <laughs> that, yeah, it's, it you is. know, I, I've experienced um, firsthand, but the other, the other one mm -hmm. I wanted to, to go over was the optimism and 
pessimism bias mm-hmm. where, you know, just think of thinking of a realistic example here is let's say cloud adoption where, you know, executives are focused on cost savings mm-hmm. um, and, and what we can do to get out of the being, you know, physically in a data center and stuff like that. But um, then the IT teams and security teams um, have a more realistic manner where, you know, we're, we're thinking about the timelines and mm-hmm. the, the, the level of effort that, that it takes, the timelines are too condensed. We mm. don't have training, trained people to, to do the work and, and all that kind of stuff. So to your point earlier, it would be great to have two of those, um, on the executive team to yeah. even that out up front. So, yeah. you know, not, so the executives are not blinded by the cost savings mm-hmm. only because we can all yeah. agree to that. But then when, you know, we, we all have to deal with it on the IT side, it, it's difficult. Mm-hmm. So that's it. Excellent. Thank you, Robert. Yeah, it's definitely something that's a challenge. You know, when I talk to leadership teams, I strongly encourage them to think, focus on hiring. They tend to hire too many optimists and to hire at least a couple of pessimists and to make sure to give those pessimists a strong voice. And going back to what you're talking about, yes, the assessment would be great if you can do it before problems occur, kind of put out the fires in advance rather than let the fires spread out. Good. Room nine. Okay, so our group talked about Mm -hmm. the assessment. Um, Everyone thought the assessment would be useful or valuable to take, that it forces reflection and mm-hmm. could help with self-improvement um, to eliminate mm-hmm. biases. Giving, giving a name and a description to the biases helps to bring them to the forefront of the mind. Um, it was suggested that it could be really useful for teams to take at the beginning of a major project or initiative, mm-hmm. or for audit teams to take to promote an understanding among the members of their perceptions. It mm-hmm. might also be useful for teams to take um, on a mid-project basis. If a team seems mm-hmm. to be getting off track, maybe it might help them get back on a more collaborative track, um, yeah. all with the goal of hopefully producing an improved work project. Mm-hmm. Um, and then we talked about the optimistic versus pessimistic bias. Four members saw themselves as pessimistic and one mm-hmm. optimistic. Um, That's the breakdown that I see in IT and security and auditing frequently. Yep. Are, are, okay, so we're we're uh, falling into the um, the normal the normal by the normal band. Um, yes. So though some of us who were pessimistic did prefer the term realistic over pessimistic. Sure. Um, but some it was interesting how some folks saw themselves as being definitely optimistic versus pessimistic, but others saw it as being more contextually related. Mm-hmm. Yeah, if they are not like super extremely pessimistic and depending on who they relate with. Excellent. Thank you. Good discussion. And uh, yes, so talking using the assessment in that way is definitely helpful. And finally, room 10. Hi, um, this is Jennifer. I was in group 10 Mm -hmm. and we also talked about the optimism bias and pessimism Mm -hmm. bias. And some of what we talked about has already been covered here with the other groups. Mm -hmm. But one thing we discussed was if you are a certain, if you already know that you tend to lean to one way or the other, Mm -hmm. ways that you can present your ideas, your concerns, or your points in meetings so that you don't just come across as, oh, she's always Pollyanna or she's Mm -hmm. always so negative, but ways that you can present your ideas so that you don't come across that way and that you can um, ask questions that can yield group discussion rather Mm. than it feeling like two sides of the table against each other. Um, Magnus gave some examples about, first he said that he tends to be toward the um, optimistic side, but he gave some Mm. examples about um, types of questions that he might ask if he's in a situation where an individual might be leaning toward calling an audit exception a deficiency, Mm. some ways that he can lead conversation and help to perhaps open some ideas and not immediately go straight for the worst case scenario. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Good. Good. So good insights on how optimists and pessimists can use questioning and lead the conversation in a healthy direction. Good. Thank you. All right, everyone.
Thank you, Jennifer. And let's take a 15 minute break. So be back at 25. See you then. Great, thank you.
We'll be starting in about two minutes. All right, everyone, hope you're all back. Let's restart for the final part of the presentation. So we'll be talking about a couple of techniques to help you make the best decisions and to help your teams make the best decisions in the context, of course, of addressing the human factors of security, of risk management, compliance, and so on. So let's talk about those couple of techniques. The first is Five question is five question to avoid decision disasters technique. So using five questions to make the best decisions and avoid decision disasters. These questions are specifically targeted at addressing a number of cognitive biases at once to help you and your teams to make the best decisions. That's the goal of these five questions. And it's great for you to make decisions better yourself and to help your team do so as well, including for individual decision-making and for group decision-making. So for individual decision-making, anytime you want to make sure that you're not making a bad decision, whether it's sending an email in the context of an audit that's going to be tricky and you want to figure out what to do, or making a hire, or figuring out how to improve a process, you can use these five questions when you make, want to make a good decision and your team decision-making. So you'll want everyone on the team to answer the questions in advance of a team meeting and then come to the meeting with the questions answered and use the questions as a way to guide the decision-making process. It'll maximize the chance. It'll greatly cut down the amount of time that you have to think about the, de the decision. It'll really cut down the decision-making time invested. So let's go through the questions one by one. So you'll see what I mean. First, what important information didn't I yet fully consider? So what evidence are you not taking into account? We tend to not fully consider information goes against our intuition, against our beliefs. So take a look more strongly into, at information that goes against your intuition, against your beliefs. Weigh that evidence more heavily. And also think about what information is important. Information that's important, you don't want to fall into analysis paralysis by considering all information. So look at information that's important. Decide in advance what information is going to be important. So again, this question asks you to disprove yourself, to try to prove yourself wrong, not to try to prove yourself wrong. Don't make a business case for yourself. Try to prove yourself wrong. If you can't, you're much more likely to be right. 
Second, what dangerous judgment errors didn't I yet fully address? So if you know yourself to be an optimist, maybe you didn't address the all the risks. If you know yourself to be a pessimist, maybe you're being too down on the idea. The halo effect, if you know that uh, if you like the person that you're dealing with in terms of an audit, maybe you're not checking them as thoroughly. The overconfidence bias, you remember that putting yourself in the top half of all drivers, it might not be the top half of all drivers. So think about all of these issues, planning fallacy of projects. What would a trusted and objective advisor suggest they do? So think about that angel on your shoulder. What would that angel suggest you do? Think about a colleague from Isaka. What would they suggest you do? Someone trustworthy. Yeah. Think about giving them a call and asking them. That's also easy to do. So that's the first three that helps you make the decision well. Now we're switching to implementation to help you implement the decision well. Fourth, how have I addressed the ways this could fail? So imagine the decision failed, it completely failed, no question about it. Now go back and think about why it failed. What are all the reasons for failure? And try to address those reasons and prevent the failure from occurring. Finally, what new information would cause me to revisit this decision? What would cause you to decide that the decision is wrong? Try to think about all of these reasons and address them in advance. And again, for yourself, could just take a couple of minutes to go through this once you are trained yourself to go through it. And for your team, it'll greatly cut down the decision-making time and efforts if you use this for a decision-making meeting. Now, thinking about these five questions, how valuable do you think this quest technique might be to help you make good decisions for you and your team to use the five questions? Please go ahead and vote. Okay, see most people voted. Well, let's see, I'll give five more seconds to folks to share their thoughts about the benefits of the five questions technique. Okay, great to see 98% of you think this would be highly or moderately valuable. That's excellent. Over half of you think that this would be highly valuable. That's great. and. The vast majority of the rest would think it's moderately valuable. Good. So let's take a minute because this is a more a little bit more of a complex thing. And please write down for your notes where and how you might use this in your own decision making and in, in your team decision making, encouraging your team to use it. So please go ahead, take a minute to do so.
Hey. Great. So we'll move on to talk about another technique. So this is a technique to help you make the best decisions. So the five key questions are great to avoid decision disasters. When you want to make especially smaller decisions, less significant ones, or when you need to make a major decision quickly. But it's not a technique to help you make the best decisions, to optimize your decision-making process. Let's talk about a technique to do so. so this will have eight steps. Identify the need for decision-making process. Gather information. Set specific and clear goals. Develop clear criteria for decision-making. Generate viable options, evaluate the options, picking the best, implement the options, and evaluate the implementation, revising it as needed. Let's talk about each one. Identifying the need for decision-making process. Now, why is this not obvious? Often, there's no explicit problem. So when the process keeps going on, especially from an IT security compliance perspective, there might be underlying issues that have not yet bubbled to the surface. So right tail events with low probability, high impact that have not yet occurred, such as cyber, such as ransomware attack or so on, or many other is security issues that people underestimate the importance of changing what's going on. Our instincts sometimes make it uncomfortable to accept the need for tough decisions. So this is a serious issue, especially around people, when you're dealing with people, human factors, when we're dealing with situations that might be awkward, might be politically problematic, that might hurt people's reputations. This is definitely a challenge. So you want to recognize the need for making a good decision before it becomes an emergency. Gather information from diverse perspectives. We tend to look for information that, again, confirms our beliefs, ignore information that doesn't, especially we ignore people who don't agree with us. So we need to place a higher value on informed opinions with which you disagree. People who are informed about the issue, but who tend to disagree with you. If you're optimist, then pessimist, pessimists, then optimists, and so on. People who disagree with you, maybe people who have incentives to be in a different camp. These perspectives help you recognize your own potential bias blind spots. Next, you want to have very clear and specific goals, not just a vague aspiration. Have a clear vision for what you want to accomplish. What does it look like? Have a story of what this desired outcome looks like. Especially notice what a seemingly one-time decision has to do with underlying issues with your processes, with your systems. Get at the root causes. Make sure that that's part of your desired outcome. Develop criteria. What criteria would you use for making decisions? Let's say you want to implement a new process. You want to implement a new system. You want to address some underlying security issues. What are the criteria that you're using? So we talked earlier about the leadership team not understanding the kind of costs that data centers might have and so on. What are the criteria that they're using and that they are too optimistic about? Use these criteria to weigh the options and you'll rank the importance of each criteria on a scale of one to 10. And so then, so you have the criteria, you have them ranked. Then you generate viable options. You want to have sufficient options. We often tend to just go with, until we have one option or two options. You want to have at least five appealing options to make a good decision. Next, rank each option on each criteria. So let's say, you're having thinking about a new tool. It might range from the quality of the tool, the price of the tool, external recommendations from 30 party advisor, how easy it would be to implement and so on. And then those might be criteria. Then it rank them, each of them from one to 10 on each of the criteria. So you have five tools and rank each of them on these criteria. Then you multiply the ranks you assigned by the weight you assigned to each criteria to get a total numerical score. You want to be aware of going with what you initially preferred because we tend to overvalue that. When assigning ranks, look at your preferred choices in a harsher light. Next, implementation. How do you implement it effectively? Well, what you want to do is first imagine decision completely failed and then imagine it absolutely succeeded. So you want to hit both of those. 
in order to implement effective. What does it mean? First, imagine the decision completely failed. You totally, you're looking six months from now, the decision completely failed. Then brainstorm on what kind of problems might have contributed to this failure. Think about what might have occurred to cause the fail and consider how you might solve these problems. Then integrate the solutions into your implementation plan. Next, so that's the failure, addressing failure. Now you also want to maximize success. To do so, imagine the decision completely succeeded. Then you want to brainstorm all the reasons for why it might have succeeded and consider how you can Take advantage of whatever opportunities might have led it to succeed and integrate what you learned into your plan for implementation. Finally, metrics. Evaluate the implementation and revise as needed. You want to have very clear metrics of what a successful implementation looks like. Check in regularly at regular intervals, depending, of course, on the intensity of the project on whether you're meeting or exceeding the success metrics. If not, make sure to revise the implementation as needed. You may find that the original decision needs to be revised. So this is the technique for making the best decisions. Again, it'll take some time, unlike the previous one, which only takes a couple of minutes once you're used to it doing by yourself, or takes a relatively short time when you're doing it as a group. This technique takes a while, obviously. So this is only for major decisions. So when you want to do something really serious, or you're starting to implement a new project, something like that. So thinking about this technique, this major technique to help you make the right decisions, how valuable do you think this technique would be for you and your team to use to prevent project failures and maximize success? Please go ahead and vote. Okay, most people voted. Let's give you five more seconds to share about the decision-making technique, this making the best decisions technique, if you haven't voted yet. Okay, great. So we see it's highly popular. Again, 98% of you find it highly valuable. That's excellent. Over half would find it highly valuable. Oh. Of the rest, the, the vast majority would find moderately valuable. Great. So think about, start thinking about how you would apply it to your team. So let's take a minute and write down how you might apply this technique. Where might you find it valuable and beneficial? So please go ahead, take a minute to do so.
All right, everyone. So I hope you've benefited from this presentation. After this time, I'll send everyone some free additional resources. I'll be happy to give a coaching session. I have three slots open for first come, first serve. So I'll send you an email with the information from this talk and you'll let me know if you want that coaching session. You'll click on it and if it's available, it'll let you register. Then I'll send you the outline of the slides, a copy of the assessment, a decision aid in the five key questions, and the manual on making the best decisions, as well as a couple of other manuals that might be helpful for you. And a copy of my best-selling book, Never Go With Your Gut, How Pioneering Leaders Make the Best Decisions and Avoid Business Disasters. And I'll be happy at this stage to take any questions that you might have. You can unmute yourself or you can use the chat. John, great. You're very welcome. I'm glad to hear it was a great presentation for you. No questions, but thank you very much. It was very helpful. Excellent. I'm glad to hear, Jennifer. Tina, you're welcome. And Karen as well. Welcome to you. Joanne, great. You're welcome. Yeah, and, th and thank you for the resources. This will be helpful and, and appreciate the follow-up resources. It's a lot of information, but uh, look forward to digging in a bit more. Excellent. You'll have the resources to dig in. Brian, Tanya, Matthias, Cindy, welcome. Richard, Adam, you're welcome as well. And Cynthia, glad you appreciate the information. Rasitra and Adam, welcome. Jenny, welcome as well. Stephanie, you're welcome. Blessing, excellent, welcome. All right. Don't think that there are any questions so far. I'll give folks. Oh, I do have a question. Uh, do you? Oh do you yes, Monir, please. Yeah. Do you have a website yeah. where you share the slides and and uh, you know so some of the the data that you gave us? Yes. Uh, so let me give you my website. You. Sure. So I'll send you an email with the, all the resources I mentioned, and you can check out. So Tina shared a copy of my book. Excellent. And I shared copy of the website with the blogs. Now, I encourage everyone to connect with me on LinkedIn because I share my resources a lot there, especially new information that's coming out, studies, articles. Make sure you tell me you saw me at the Islaka Denver presentation because I have a lot of people extending connections to me and I don't accept them unless you tell me a good reason to connect. But you can follow me if you don't want to do that. But uh, if you want to connect with me, just tell me that you saw me at the Islaka Denver presentation. All right, everyone. Well, I hope you enjoy the rest of your day and I will send you the resources probably by the end of the day tomorrow. Okay. Appreciate Thank it. You so Thank much, you. Get some, get some rest. <laughs> I will. Thank you. Bye-bye, <laughs> right. right. everyone. John, glad you found the presentation helpful.